Hello, I'm Krista Petley. I'm a professor of history at the University of Southampton, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Louise Revel. Louise is an expert in Roman history, and in particular, Louise's work has looked at the impact of the Roman Empire on the Western provinces. Um, Louise, could you tell us a little bit about your work and what you find most exciting about <laughs> studying Romans? Thank you. Um... My work focuses um, predominantly on the people of the provinces, so I'm less interested in the mechanics of Roman imperialism, although that obviously plays a, pl plays a part in my work. What I'm more interested in is what imperialism, what conquest, does to the lives of the people in the provinces, um, how it shapes their daily routines, the way they live, um, but also relationships such as gender relationships, um, changing ideas of status and who is the elite in the society, all of which come about with conquest by Rome. That's, that's great. And the, the reason that we're here is to talk about a potential A-level question on the impact of the Roman mm. Empire. So you're certainly the person who can <laughs> uh, help us with that mm. and provide us with an answer of you know, how does Roman imperialism impact upon people right down to their daily lives. Mm. So the, the question that we're looking at today is about Roman Britain and we're asking how did the Roman Empire impact Britain and I suppose what everybody knows about uh, Britain and Rome is that Julius Caesar came and saw and conquered. Mm. Um, could you start us off perhaps by talking about Caesar and, and, and that famous expression and talk about very briefly uh, how Britain becomes part of the Roman Empire? Well, that expression is a piece of self-promotion by Caesar himself, writing his own accounts of his wars in Gaul, which is modern-day France. And as part of that, um, for two consecutive years, he came across to Britain. And he tells us that he fought some battles against the tribes there. But we don't know exactly what form that took. And... After that, he went away, and from what we can see, there was very little impact on Britain from these conquests. After Caesar, about 60 years later, when we're in the time of the Emperor Augustus, then we start to see some very curious changes going on in Britain, in that the local kings start to style themselves as Roman senators or Roman emperors. They start minting coinage, which has their faces on it, and they describe themselves by the Latin term of rex, which means king. So they're starting to think of themselves as Roman. They also put onto their coinage things like the seat that a Roman senator would sit on. And this has caused a bit of interest. Why? Why do they do this? And one thought is that perhaps the invasion by Caesar had a longer term political impact than we are aware of and that Rome became, sorry, that Britain became in some ways a sort of client kingdom of Rome, which we know about more from the eastern half of the empire where we do have lots of evidence for this. But as part of that, a lot of the sons of these client kings went to Rome for, to be educated, to be educated as part of Augustus's imperial household. And so one possible explanation for these changes is that these are the sons of those households coming back to Britain and starting to style themselves as tribal chiefs, yes, but also in the style of a Roman emperor. And that's the main uh, kind of changes we see until AD 43, when Claudius, as a rather um, uninspiring and unobvious emperor decides he needs to make his mark and the best way to make his mark is to conquer the furthest edges of the known world which in those days is Britain mm. and so he conquers Britain again purely for self-promotion but this time he stays he conquers with four legions um, an awful lot of troops and sends some very good um, military men and they over the course of about the next 30 years, actually conquer up to the border between England and Scotland. They conquer quite a lot of Wales and they're going down towards Cornwall as well. Um, that sort of is where the Roman boundaries end. 
Um, they're solidified by Hadrian with the construction of Hadrian's Wall in AD 122 and afterwards. Every now and then an emperor decides that he wants to invade Scotland, um, mainly to make his mark again. So we have, say, for example, Septimius Severus comes over um, and he tries to invade Scotland. But this never quite happens. And so really um, we end up with the province ending at the line of Hadrian's Wall. Hmm. Okay. So one of the things that, uh, that, that we learn then in terms of thinking about how did the Roman Empire impact Britain is that it's impacting Britain even before the main mm. invasion, oh, which yes. is extremely interesting. Yeah. But then there is this invasion, and as you've suggested to us, it um, covers whole swathes of, uh, of England mm. and into these western and northern borderlands. Um, so presumably this requires a lot of manpower, it's, a, it's very much a, a conquest by the military. So the military presence, I'm imagining, is a big part of this impact. Yes, it is. We see it at the times of the invasion where we see the construction of legionary fortresses at, for example, Gloucester. There's one at Colchester. Um, but this, in a way, is a campaigning phase. And these are turned into towns fairly shortly afterwards. And the army moves towards the north and into the northwest of Wales as well. And so what we end up with from about, say, 70 AD onwards, is actually the military very much occupying the edges of the province, not the whole province. And so large areas of southeast England are, to, large, to a large extent, demilitarised by then. Mm. But the areas where we do find the garrisons, which are roughly north of the um, Humber, um, north of um, the sort of Liverpool-Manchester area, um, going further north of that, we see a huge amount of manpower. Um, Britain usually has three legions, one in Kellyan in Wales, one in Chester, one in York. But then it has up to about 50 units of non-citizen soldiers. So we have the legions who are Roman citizens, drawn from throughout the empire by now. And on the frontiers, we have non-citizen soldiers, a lot of whom are drawn from places like Germany, um, France. There's a huge cohort coming from the Netherlands. Some are coming from as far away as Syria. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with this zone, which is a hugely multicultural zone of lots of people, of men coming from lots of different areas of the empire, bringing their own languages, their own customs, their own eating habits, and somehow having to work together as an army, a single military force. So we have a military invasion which presumably involves a certain amount of, of, of violence and fighting mm -hmm. and conflict, yeah. but that also turns parts of Britain into a kind of a cultural melting pot because of mm. all these uh, soldiers coming from different parts of the empire. Um, I'd imagine that also there are other ways in which Romans bring their own technologies and cultures mm. to Britain and, and build. Yes, I mean, one of the most noticeable features um, about Roman Britain in contrast to the late Iron Age is the building in stone um, and just the monumental building. Rome has a system of governing through towns. The Romans believed that civilization, law, everything that led to an organised society came through an organised urban settlement, came through a town. It was what they had themselves in the city of Rome. And what we find is that as they conquer Britain and other provinces at about that time, they very rapidly think about how do we govern this? How do we control this population? Particularly if we're not going to have a military force here permanently. And so we see this method being adopted in Spain, in France, in Britain, that of taking the pre-existing communities, which in Britain are tribal communities, and turning them into an urban community. Building, not huge, but very definitely Roman style towns. So somewhere like St Albans um, is a very good example where they build a forum, the centre for administration. They build temples which give you worship. They build bathhouses which brings you hygiene and new attitudes to how you present the body. Um, 
they don't necessarily have huge amounts of houses, so it's not necessarily people living in the towns. And in fact, probably a very small percentage of the population was living in towns. But it's about governing through towns, that the town council is responsible for the administration of itself, but also its surrounding area. And these town councils are drawn from the tribal chieftains. So what we find through the towns is that the Romans saying to the previous elites, almost, if you become like us, you can keep your authority, you can keep your power. Um, And that way, they persuade, coerce the people of, um, or at least the elites in Britain, to style themselves as being Romans, as being Roman magistrates. Um, And this seems to be something that we see throughout the empire. Britain is a bit more problematic. Um, How far we see this is massively debated amongst um, scholars as to whether Britain resists this or whether it doesn't. But certainly looking from the urban architecture, Britain is adopting these um, towns the public buildings that go with them, and perhaps most importantly, they carry on repairing them. So this is not something that the Romans build for the Britons and then the Britons ignore and let them fall down. They carry on repairing them, certainly through to about 300 AD. So in terms of thinking then about Roman impact on Britain, Mm. we've got these urban areas building up, and that seems to be like a very significant shift that Mm. Rome brings. But also a story that you're telling of Rome working with what's already there, including these local elites, these local chieftains, Mm. like so many empires do, um, working through local Mm. elites. Um, This you've described as a feature of of town living, but you've you've also told us that towns only account for a small amount of the population. Mm. So what about everybody else who wasn't living (laughs) in a a Roman town? What's the impact on them? For a lot of them... um, for a long time, probably not a huge amount of an impact. Um, they may suddenly start using this strange metal stuff called coinage, because although we have coinage in the decades, two, three decades prior to conquest, it's not clear that this is actually being used by the entire population. These are actually symbols of authority, mm-hmm. far more than ways of transacting business. But they will have started using, and certainly most of the sites we look at have evidence of coinage. So they'll have suddenly moved away from thinking about bartering to thinking about, oh, we have this wealth that we have. We have these strange metal tokens with some weird person's head on it that we exchange for whatever. Mm. Um, Instead of paying their dues, paying their taxes in whatever form to their local tribal chief, they pay it to Roman officials. Possibly these may be the same people. It may still be the tribal chiefs responsible for collecting it. But now they're paying probably in coinage and probably um, this is then going to Rome. This is then being taken away from the province. Um, They will have had access to new crops. Um, And one of the things we see are changes in the kinds of wheat people are growing, the kinds of grains people are growing. Apples. They now have apples, which they didn't have before. They had crab apples, but they didn't have nice eating apples. Um, mm. They may have had different breeds of um, animal, which carried more meat, for example. So we see a lot of changes in agriculture, um, which might have made their farms potentially more productive. Great, thank you. So we, we're we starting to develop a picture then of... Um, a military invasion in the first instance um, of uh, a, a huge amount of uh, different cultures and uh, and groups from around the empire coming together in these military garrisons. New towns, Romans working with existing elites, and then all of these impacts on people's lives, including in the countryside, including new things to eat, um, as well as new buildings to uh, occupy or, or look at. So it's a a transformation in, in all different areas mm. of life. I wonder, to conclude, Louise, could you talk about how you think this shaped Britain during the period of, of Roman rule? Because, of course, it goes on for a, quite a long time, mm. doesn't it? Yes, I mean, Roman rule continues for about 350 years, and it ends at the very beginning of the 5th century when the whole of the Western Empire comes under the pressure from Germanic invasions. Um, 
Britain is one of the earliest of the Western provinces to be told to look to its own defence or to be left to, to its own devices. Um, there was probably problems in a couple of decades leading up to that, and certainly we see some evidence of lack of coinage coming in, things like that. For the 350 years that Rome ruled Britain, life had changed completely for the people living there to what they had experienced prior to Roman conquest. But one of the things that I think to a certain extent we still can't exactly explain is why there seems to be a very rapid change once Rome withdraws or tells Britain to look to its own devices, where very rapidly we see towns going out of use, where the um, elite farms go out of use, where um, Roman-style temples go out of use. And this is something that we are still thinking about and thinking about alternative explanations. Is it that Roman rule was actually incredibly ephemeral and that it never really penetrated through society? Except that when we look at people's lives, there are changes, there are differences. Um, is it that without the framework of being part of an empire, the things that they had adopted stopped making sense and therefore bathing was no longer important? This could explain why we start to see it happening earlier, particularly in terms of the political changes, because actually thinking about the Roman Empire as a single thing is problematic because we have major changes in about 300 AD alongside the advent of Christianity or at least the adoption of Christianity but also a huge shift in the political ruling of the empire which puts less emphasis on the towns and the urban elites and so they had already started to rethink their role within their societies. Mm -hmm. So it's whether you think of it as an instant Rome has now gone and therefore we have a rapid change or whether there are longer um, processes, longer term processes going on, which are suddenly brought to a very rapid fruition by Rome leaving. That's really interesting. Mm. Thank you. So in terms of us thinking then about how the Roman Empire impacted Britain, for those 350 years where Rome was ruling Britain, mm. it seems as though the impacts are huge. But you're suggesting that for various reasons, those impacts don't necessarily last mm. yeah. um, in the period afterwards. Yes. Not that Britain goes back to what it had before. Um, this is made slightly problematic that we talk about the pre-conquest Iron Age as being Celtic and the post-Roman, um, we then carry on talking about the Celtic world. It doesn't go back to what it had. Um, 350 years, you cannot set the clock back on that. Instead, it takes off on a new trajectory. But of course, that is rapidly curtailed by the Anglo-Saxon invasions and another set of changes. And so possibly there just isn't enough time to see what these impacts might have been mm. of Rome leaving. Louise, thank you very, very much for your time. That's been absolutely mm. fascinating. Thank you.